try without the microphone if uh, uh, people can hear me. Uh, great pleasure to be here tonight. Um, so I'm going to talk about there is a, a system in this country, there's a process in this country, um, which has come about um, as the result of a number of tragedies. Uh, in those tragedies, um, people were killed, people were harmed, and lives were damaged. In this process, there is a duty on the full range of public authorities to give serious attention to this matter, to have policies and procedures uh, concerning this matter, to be constantly monitoring activity in their institutions concerning this matter. And it is essentially, particularly looking out for people who may have extreme views, and people in particular who may translate those material, those extreme views, um, into action which may harm vulnerable people. As part of this big programme, there is a huge system of gathering information, but at, at, both at the local and at the national level. If you come under the suspicion of this regime, then information can be held against you. You will find it extremely difficult to get that information removed and that information will seriously damage your chances of getting a position and a job in quite a wide range of occupations. Now obviously what I'm talking about is the safeguarding regime which came about uh, as a result of the Soham uh, murders of Jessica and Holly in Cambridgeshire some years ago. It is a system which puts those responsibilities on every public agency. Um, it, uh, it is a huge industry you could describe it as. Uh, as I say, it's got a huge information gathering system. And if suspicions are raised that you may have, for instance, extreme views about certain sexual behaviour, and there are suspicions that you may have uh, indulged in, in some of that behaviour against vulnerable people, then that will completely harm your reputation. Uh, and I can only tell you, you'll find it very, very difficult to get those suspicions removed. And of course, that's another debate in the media today, uh, very much uh, about that, that whole issue. Um, and that whole philosophy as well was used as well to deal with, a, with another issue we had a number of years ago, uh, which was the problem um, of street gangs and guns in our big cities. Um, there was a time um, uh, in the early 2000s where, particularly in London, Manchester and Birmingham, um, there was a dreadful toll um, of young men killing one another in street gangs. Uh, at that time, Manchester uh, got the label of Gunchester because of the level of killings, uh, particularly in the Moss Side area. Um, and again, as a result of that, the police and other agencies put together a program to try and deal with that. And at one end, obviously, that involved um, very high-level investigations, very complex investigations to try and get the perpetrators um, convicted uh, and particularly to disrupt the, uh, the gang activity. But at the other end, it was very much working with other agencies to try and identify uh, particularly young men and indeed girls who were vulnerable to be drawn into that gang activity. And then as a result, clearly putting themselves at enormous risk. And that included in some cases of being prepared to use care proceedings if we felt a child was being drawn into gang activity and the family in particular were not taking sufficient care of that child. And that whole program, which had huge community support uh, and very active churches and other people involved, um, actually was incredibly successful um, in reducing uh, the number of killings uh, to the extent that Manchester went through whole years without any, uh, any shootings at all. So the point I'm making, really, is that PREVENT um, is constantly in the news, it is constantly criticised, it is constantly told it is a toxic brand. Even today, there are 368 distinguished people who have signed a letter to The Guardian um, saying that PREVENT is damaging trust in our society. So you can imagine, as the National Police Lead for PREVENT, um, it was a very, very active job in terms of um, the level of media interest. But the point I'm trying to make um, is actually the, prevent, the philosophy behind PREVENT, the philosophy um, of trying to get agencies to work together, sharing information, trying to protect vulnerable people, 
is actually something which is, has been used successfully in those other areas in the past. And obviously the interesting thing to debate and discuss is, <coughs> when that is the case, why is Prevent viewed with such suspicion? Why does it have this sort of toxicity um, around it? Um, why does it generate this level of suspicion and concern? <coughs> and to some degree, when you think about that, you actually have to think about cases like Rig Lee Rigby. I found the Lee Rigby case really interesting. Lee, Lee, Lee Rigby, as you know, was the soldier, of duty soldier, um, who was stabbed to death um, in London. And you look at that case and think, well, that's a case of a young man being stabbed on the streets of London. And actually, it happens every week. But what is it about that case which generated such massive, massive political and public interest? Now, people would argue because it's terrorism, because of the motives of the people who are involved. And I accept all that. But it is still quite remarkable, um, the level of interest that that generates, the level of public debate, the level of public concern, um, some of the uh, activity by extremists around the country. You know, we, we, Lee Rigby actually came from an area of Greater Manchester, and you can imagine that English Defence League and all the rest turned up to try and exploit the situation. But it says something about this whole issue of terrorism um, and extremism, um, about the reaction to it, which is, and some of it almost feels irrational and hard to actually understand. But you will understand that as an operational chief constable, that was the atmosphere that we had to operate in, whether we liked it or not. And so my argument really is that this whole debate around how to deal with the threat of terrorism and violent extremism, unfortunately, does exist in this very toxic atmosphere, um, you know, which has a number of different components to it, which I will explore. Um, and therefore, when people say that, that it's the prevent program, which is damaging trust and is creating this huge suspicion um, towards the Muslim community in particular, it has to be seen in the context um, of this wider environment um, that this whole issue um, actually exists within. So as Ken said, I was um, you know, national lead for the PREVENT program um, back in about 19, 1998. Um, the way that the British policing works, we have 43 police forces, we don't have a national police force. Um, and therefore, to get anything done on national policy, individual chief officers have to volunteer to do some national work. Um, and I was very interested in race and diversity and issues like that and volunteered. Um, and I was uh, given responsibility for um, relations with um, religious groups. So you can imagine I went round meeting bishops and um, uh, obviously met uh, leaders uh, in various aspects of the, of the Muslim faith. And it was a yeah, fairly benign discussion. We talked about uh, changing police uniform and helping officers during Ramadan and things like that. And of course, 9-11 happened. Um, and everything changed uh, with September the 11th. But particularly it changed with uh, the July the 7th bombings. Because you remember the particular aspect of the July the 7th bombings was that when you looked at the background of the four individuals who carried out the bombings, um, and you went back to the area of Leeds where they come from, clearly there were very strong indications um, that were there as to why these, uh, these, these men had suddenly changed their opinions, um, had suddenly developed very extremist thinking, um, and then uh, they decided to take that to, obviously, a very violent outcome. Uh, and so there was big pressure then to say, well, if this was known in the community, if there were signs out there that agencies should have identified and done something about, then can we put together a programme to try and deal with that? The other thing I would highlight, um, and people may have their views about the British Police Service and how we do and how we operate, um, but actually the whole notion of prevent um, is very much in the whole culture of British policing. If you go back to the, uh, the policing principles laid down by Peel in 1829, it is very, very clear that the role of the police is actually to prevent crime and disorder. He actually said that was the evidence of police effectiveness. It wasn't the evidence of police activity. It was actually the absence of crime and disorder. <coughs> so British policing has always been on the whole about trying to prevent conflict and things happening if at all possible. So the CRS in France, on the whole, love to have a great big violent battle with the protesters. You know, and you see that in France, don't you? They can get out the tear gas and they can get out the petrol bombs and the smoke. They seem to love it. Um, that is not our philosophy in the UK. If at all possible, we will negotiate the protesters. We will try and agree 
places where people can protest and, and, and on the whole, we will try and identify people who may want to go to that protest with violent uh, aims uh, and try and see if we can prevent that. And it's a whole philosophy behind neighborhood policing and everything else we do. Um, and so, um, you know, that's really where policing starts from and therefore, um, this notion of trying to work to identify people who may be vulnerable be, be drawn into violent extremism. Um, you know, it's not that surprising that the police gave it so much uh, prominence. But of course, it was all then wound up in these wider issues about integration, about racism, about Islamophobia, about community cohesion. And, and then we get into this debate about so-called British values and extremism, where it gets more difficult. Um, and I particularly wanted to dwell about this particular issue about the counter-extremism bill, um, which we've still not seen. Uh, we were promised some time ago that the draft bill would be published. Uh, there's no sign of it at the moment being published. And I think there's some real complexity um, about, uh, about that uh, uh, particular you know, act and those particular proposals. So essentially, I'm sure you know that the way that PREVENT works it is essentially PREVENT and the channel program um, are basically, as I say, about what happens day to day in policing. It's about, on the whole, um, working with other agencies. It's about gathering information um, from the community uh, about those involved in crime or those that might be attracted to crime. That's the basic philosophy um, behind it. And as I've said, um, it very much um, you know, follows um, the philosophy we used around safeguarding. Now, the difficulty I saw with PREVENT um, was it was very much a police-led initiative. So for a long time, it was about the police um, actually leading this. And I think that, in a way, was one of the reasons why um, it partic particularly got a bad name. Now, clearly, there was legislation last year which actually extended the prevent duty to um, public sector organisations like schools, the health service, councils, um, and obviously universities and colleges. And that has clearly provoked um, a very active debate um, about that, um, including, I'm sure, in this particular institution. And a lot of people thought that as SIP saw that as being pernicious, that it was extending um, the police state in a way that it was asking teachers and lecturers and others, uh, in effect, to be part of the security apparatus. Uh, my contention would actually be the opposite. My contention was actually the dangerous thing, was that when PREVENT was seen as a police responsibility um, and being police-led. Uh, and what I felt was the whole aim of extending the PREVENT duty was, number one, to try and encourage open debate about these issues in institutions, for instance, to institutions to be clear about what were their policies and values um, in terms of extremist speakers uh, and extremist thought uh, and, and, and extremist views and opinions and, and what institutions found as acceptable and not acceptable. And therefore then that agencies had clear policies on how they then dealt with this issue, particularly when suspicions were raised um, about a particular individual. And I know all that sounds, again, very language of secure cracks and very la much language of security. Um, but again, I think it is much better that institutions have policies about this. And so again, one of the things which became a big issue for the media um, was prevent going into nurseries. So again, nursery staff being expected to monitor for potential terrorists. Yeah? Um, and it does sound pretty frightening, doesn't it? It does sound pretty frightening. But on the other hand, you know, the, the, the sort of scenarios we might deal with, um, or might be raised, is what happens if you know, you're running your nursery um, and a young lad comes in um, and says he absolutely refuses to sit next to little girls. How are you going to deal with that? Is that something you're concerned about? Is that okay if he says that? Will you put him on a table um, and allow him never to play with girls? Um, if he says that's because his father has told him um, that, you know, he must never mix with girls, and almost he has an opinion that girls are a lower form of life. Is that something which is okay? Now, my argument would be not that absolutely ring the cops, we've got a serious problem in here, let's bring the police in. It is that institutions like the nursery should have policies and procedures about how they deal with that. That, presume, you know, that they know, do nursery staff have a policy about, can parents say that my lad must never mix with girls? I have no particular opinion or not. I just think that it is something that you'd expect an institution to be running a nursery to have a policy on. Even a primary school, 
um, you know, reception class. Um, little Johnny keeps on, you know, comes in, and every day when the teacher asks them to do some drawing, he keeps on drawing a picture of a gun. <coughs> Uh, and when the teacher sort of pushes it, um, he says that, um, well, you know, Daddy showed me a gun last night, um, and Daddy says that guns are wonderful things. Again, I'm not saying that you expect that school to ring the police immediately, come down and do a search warrant and take the house apart, but I would expect that that institution has a policy of actually dealing with that. And in all my experience, schools and institutions do have policies of dealing with that, particularly schools um, in complex areas like Greater Manchester, where you unfortunately do have children come to school uh, whose families may well be involved in organised crime, where you've got very diverse populations in your school, where there could be tensions between Christian children and Jewish children and Muslim children. And in my experience, um, head teachers, deputy heads, teachers are very skilled in how to deal with that um, and use their common sense and their judgment to know is this something the school can deal with is this something that we need to call the parents in about? Is this something that we need to call a safeguarding meeting uh, to share information with other agencies and see what they know need to, um, you know, uh, and what they know about this family and whether there is a wider cause of concern? Um, and also have policies where they know, gosh, this looks so dangerous that we think we do have to call the police because we think somebody is in immediate danger. And that, in reality, goes on every <coughs> single day. Um, in our schools, um, in, uh, particularly in cities like Greater Manchester. Um, that is essentially what goes on. Um, and therefore, the extend, extending of the prevent duty, um, I essentially saw as a positive move because it was drawing that into that safeguarding way of working, that safeguarding methodology that people use every single day. But on the other hand, that does, I accept, have to be seen in that wider context of the wider <coughs> media conversation about this issue, which can make teachers and others very scared about this whole issue. Uh, and because, unfortunately, the way that it can be then uh, talked about, and particularly the way that the media can portray it, is it looks like this is just focused on the Muslim population alone. And again, you know, I can only tell you that prevent, um, while inevitably uh, there's more information about so-called Islamic extremism, and absolutely does deal with right-wing extremism, um, uh, and has quite a high proportion of people um, that have gone through the programme uh, for those particular uh, reasons and those particular ideologies. But as I say, we see it as part of a wider drive um, in terms of vulnerable people. Um, you know, it, it becomes part of that safeguarding conversation. I know some may say, well, you know, that's not the duty of the state, that is not something the state should get involved in, the state shouldn't be policing people's thinking. Um, I can understand that point of view, but again, it, as I say, it's, it, it's, it's not the reality, really, that we live within and the way that society has developed. Particularly, as I say, when you, when you think about issues like the safeguarding regime, that society believes it does have responsibility to try and protect vulnerable people um, and to identify um, people who may have such extreme views that they may take that into behaviour which then damages vulnerable people um, and, and, and damages society. And it also lives within, again, whether we like it or not, um, a regime where public servants feel incredibly vulnerable that if something happens, if a tragedy happens and it then turns out that people in the system had suspicions or knew what was going on, or there were indications that those public servants will be held accountable. And often I found that politicians never really understood that dynamic. You know, why is there a huge increase in the number of children going into care? It's because the baby P case, because social workers are dead scared that if I make the wrong judgment and a child uh, you know, ends up subject to a tragedy, then I'm going to be blamed. And even if it's moving more and more, I could even be subject to a criminal investigation and even in prison that's happened to that police officer and that PCSO uh, you may have seen in Bristol uh, about a week ago. Um, and therefore, you can't move away from that. You can't move away from the fact that public servants and senior police officers, and to be fair, even politicians, will know that a tragedy, if a tragedy happens, 
people won't say, well, that's just one of those things that happens in a democratic <coughs> society, and we understand the balance between security and liberty, and therefore if a tragedy occurs, but it's all okay, because it was in the wider context of liberty, people will immediately go out and say, well, who is to blame for this? The police should have prevented it from happening. Why were MI5 not doing something? Why did this teacher in this school, these children, you know, that this attack had come from, not, not do something? So it has to be seen. So unless society suddenly becomes, in a way, a lot more balanced and a lot more mature and says that if a tragedy occurs, you know, we will accept that that's something which just happens, it's inevitable, then the trouble is that dynamic is created. That dynamic is created. And it comes back again about, to some degree, what might be seen as an irrational response to some of these issues. Um, you can imagine there was huge public concern after the attacks in Paris. Um, could this happen here? Is it safe to go out in Manchester? You try and tell people that actually <laughs> you are most at risk from the guy you're living with. That is, that's the reality, but you try and explain that when you've got all the bit public fear about what happened in Paris to say, no, actually the most dangerous thing you could do in Manchester is cross the road. It's very, very hard to get that across without almost looking like me as a chief constable almost doesn't know what I'm talking about and, and, and doesn't understand the public mood. So as I say, all, 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 all you know, fits in with that, with that agenda. But the trouble is, as I say, if these are in. So I understand that people blame prevent for all these things happening. Um, I think the difficulty is, is particularly that wider media atmosphere. Um, and I know that there will be, um, you know, very learned people in this institution that will be able to point back centuries um, to the whole, um, you know, the, to, 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 to the beginning of the, you know, the, the battle between Christianity and the Muslim faith and uh, the whole, um, you know, hostility that builds up. Because clearly within this, you know, whether we like it or not, there is a still a very, very strong feature of them and us. Uh, and of course, that's how that feeds into. So the debate about prevent feeds into whether we like it or not a fairly toxic particular media agenda which is very much about them and us. I don't need to tell you really about, you know, what feels like an endless stream um, of media stories, particularly concentrated on the, the Muslim population. And I absolutely, because I did huge, huge amounts of work with the, with the Muslim community, there is such a thing as the Muslim community, um, where I can understand how people are very, very angry uh, about the way that their faith is portrayed and the way that certain um, extremists, if not idiots, um, are allowed to actually grab that agenda, um, you know, and, 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 and it lives within that sort of media bubble. Um, this year is a hundred years, you may know, since the Easter Rising in Dublin, um, and I've, because I've got Irish background, we're doing some work on that. I found it quite interesting talking to quite a lot of Irish people that they say, even though they were in London at the time of a lot of the um, terrorist attacks in London, which were uh, truly awful at the time. Um, that they never felt any animosity as Irish people, despite the fact all this was going on. <coughs> Somehow, you know, the mood was not directed about towards the Irish community in this country. But unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be happening in this situation. Um, you know, despite the fact that you know this, the, 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 the you know the attacks and the threats you know are coming from uh, this very very extreme element. Um, the difficulty is it then translates into a wider animosity towards the Muslim faith in particular. Um, so the challenges really uh, in taking forward, you know, with Prevent was certainly particularly in the early days, it was all conflated um, with the debate about foreign policy and, and the Iraq war. So really when that was happening, we well understand that it wasn't just the Muslim, uh, Muslim people, lots of other people had a huge issue. Um, about uh, foreign policy and particularly about the Iraq war and therefore some of the activities around prevent could almost be, be, be seen as a, an attempt by the government to try and identify people who are opposed to that. Um, there's always a, a, a difficult uh, you know, crossing point somehow between when you're doing community policing, when you're trying to gather information, when you're trying to build relationships um, with local communities about when does that become intelligence gathering and when does that become spying? Again, very, very difficult issue. Um, the other clearly dynamic which changed within this period um, was then the whole advent of social media. The fact that where in the past, perhaps parents, schools, the community 
to try and protect vulnerable children, um, the difficulty is, is that um, all this ideology, um, all this extreme ideology is coming into your child's smartphone, um, is coming into your child's bedroom. Um, and I think that in itself, in a way, created a bit of a climate of fear that when you saw, as we had in Manchester, two 16-year-old girls doing extremely well at school, um, you know, one morning get up um, and uh, get their passports uh, and take some cash and, and, and get to Manchester Airport and fly to Turkey and then very quickly across the border to become so-called Jehenny Brides. You can understand how that absolutely unnerved schools, teachers, um, uh, you know, wider society in terms of that ability of um, social media. And of course, we all know that ISIS are extremely good um, at actually uh, using that. And that then, of course, creates a whole issue about what's the counter-narrative um, and how you, you, you theological change. So as I say, some of the complexities of this is about the fact that when you look at it just in terms of, well, you know, this is about absolutely people being killed, but sort of lots of people get killed sadly, lots of people get murdered. But it is this issue about how a terrorist attack in particular has such far reading, far reaching complexities, and particularly the impact that it has on community cohesion, because I think that is always the you know the big worry about the so-called uh, backlash. And certainly, you know, because of that threat, you've then got terrorist legislation covers a very wide range of activity, um, you know, which can cause quite a lot of public concern as well. You're trying to work out in this whole debate about extremism about when does opposition to foreign policy become extremism. There's the crossover with religious conservatism and some of those sorts of debates. Um, and as I say, feeds into a media stereotyping and this whole debate about immigration and them and us. And really within that then, clearly, um, you then get up this wider debate <coughs> about you know, British values uh, and about counter-extremism. So while I absolutely support the whole philosophy behind the prevent agenda and I've tried to explain um, why I think it fits into a wider philosophy of protecting vulnerable people and a wider policing philosophy. When you start trying to take that further um, into counter-extremism and in a way getting into territory which is almost deciding what it's acceptable for people to think or not and I think that's where it gets really dangerous. Um, and some of this is really about whether you think it's you know, there is a, almost a positive air to this, that you want to celebrate the diversity of this country. And within that diversity, you want to try and make sure, yes, there are some common values that knit us together, and whether it almost starts from that position, or whether it starts from a position, no, there are some dangerous people out there with extreme views, and we're going to try and find them. Because again, one of the other, and you know, I've, I've done a lot of work on race and diversity, um, and again, often the police were seen as it was our fault. Um, the police, you know, we were too politically correct. I went from a position in my early days of policing where the police were being accused of being racist. Towards the effect, at the end, it felt like we were accused of not being racist enough and being too politically, you know, correct. Um, but you know, essentially, uh, and, and one of the challenges was multiculturalism has failed. Now, I vehemently disagree with that. Um, has been somebody who, you know, as I say, has, has worked in very diverse places. I think the great strength of this country is actually multiculturalism has been a huge success. Because we've, you know, take Manchester as an example. Manchester, the third most diverse city in the world, if you compare the number of languages spoken to the population. Yes, we have our issues, we have our tensions, but overall, I think it's a wonderful success story. Because lots and lots of people from all sorts of different backgrounds, essentially, you know, come to our city uh, and prosper and live reasonably happily together. And yes, we are affected by tensions. You know, it was only when we had the conflict in Libya, we found out we had the biggest Libyan population outside Libya, um, but we dealt with that. But I actually think, you know, this country is a massive success. Uh, and I know I've got no way we wish to, you know, decry French society, but I do think there is now quite a stark difference between the way that we have approached it in the UK um, and the way that the French have approached it. 
So you could argue simplistically that in France, if you wear the headscarf, you'll get fined. <coughs> in our country, if you wear the headscarf, you win British Bake Off. Um, you know, and I actually thought in a way that was quite a stark example. But I actually think, you know, our diversity is a real strength. And we found a way in our country, yes, and as I say, we have our tensions, we sometimes have our difficulties, but on the whole, particularly at the sort of local level that I operate in in, in, in Manchester, uh, on the whole, people come to this country. And I, I always thought one of the greatest British values was live and then live. That, on the whole, um, in very diverse areas like in Manchester, people just get along, they're sharing, you know, they're working together in workplaces, and I'm actually very optimistic, particularly when you see young people um, and the way that they're growing up uh, without all the prejudices and, and hang-ups that I had. Now, the question is that when you've got that, almost does government try and come in and in some ways try and accelerate that situation or almost come at it from a different angle and say, well, um, rather than trying to promote that and celebrate that and trying to say within that, we perhaps need to do some work about what are the common values we all build us upon, whether you come at it from the, almost the other end of the spectrum to say, well, you've got to try and find out who these extremists are and take action against them. Um, and of course, the difficulty that gets into um, is your definition of who is an extremist. Um, and I was involved in some of the early consultation about that. Um, it came at its extremism. It was actually based around um, the characteristics which are there in sort of diversity legislation. So it pulled out the personal characteristics around race and gender and sexuality um, and essentially said somebody was an extremist if they were directing their activity towards that group uh, or towards people because of their personal characteristic um, and were a threat to their, public, to their personal safety. The difficulty was, was the definition of personal safety included alarm, harassment, or distress. Now, that for me felt very, very wide-ranging. Very, very wide-ranging. Uh, I was in, involved in a debate at one point about could you come up with a legal definition of a madrasa that was not a Sunday school? Uh, and my big concern, and the reality again of day-to-day -day life in a place like Manchester, um, there's a place in Manchester called Piccadilly Gardens, um, but the, the sort of centre of the city. We have fundamentalist Christians who will stand up um, and preach loudly that homosexuality is sinful. We will have members of the gay community turn up and will say that they are affronted by this behaviour um, and try and make a complaint to a police officer. And we had a case where the police officer had been arrested a fundamentalist Christian and we ended up paying that money for an unlawful arrest. Um, and so really my argument is the police should not be in this territory. The police should not be in this territory. So there are real dangers and real difficulties of how you define extremism, um, but also then drawing um, the police into essentially having to make those judgments. And I personally believe that is not where the police should be, and it is very much um, the start of the police state. So this whole debate really about, uh, also about then how does that translate into debates in places like universities. What caused me concern was that when I first took over as the prevent lead, um, I used to get reports about how police officers had to approach universities and institutions to say, this person you've got speaking is an extremist and you should not allow it to happen. Um, and success was if you could try to persuade the university or to, to, to ban the speaker. Or and it was like it was often a venue, it was a you know a hall or whatever. If you could get the owner of that hall to actually say sorry, your booking's been cancelled. Now I, I was profoundly uncomfortable with that. I did not see that as should be the role of the police in a democracy, and not something which was what British policing was about. And that's personally why I particularly pushed that this should be, as Ken said in, in, from the, the the article, this should be the responsibility of civil society. It should be the responsibility of institutions themselves to, you know, to decide that this institution and its values, <coughs> what is, it, is, it, 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 is it acceptable or not acceptable? Uh, if people turn up with certain views, uh, is it okay for those to express those views? Do we need to have somebody challenging those views? Or does it get to a point where those views are so unacceptable, so offensive against the views of this institution that we uh, will not have them speak at all? Um, and without in any way decrying any particular institution, what I found interesting was that when we got into this, uh, it turned out that student union bodies themselves were banning quite a lot of different speakers and saying we will not have these people in our institution. 
Um, and I felt that well, if that's the case, fine, but that at least should be public in terms of, you know, uh, this policy. So I may be naive, but I certainly felt it would be, it, would, it was much more positive if institutions were encouraged to have an open debate. And again, coming back to almost the, the example of sexuality, <coughs> that you would hope in a school, as part of the sex education lessons, teachers would be encouraging you know, a healthy, open debate about these issues, where young people had the chance to express some of their concerns, some of their doubts, some of their questions, and teachers were skilled on how to deal with that, that that should be exactly the same conversation, exactly the same dynamic about this particular issue, about extremism, about the tensions between different faiths, about young people who may have profound concerns um, and doubts about things like foreign policy or about the activities of certain religions and the beliefs of certain religions, that that should be part of a much more open, active debate. So I'm disappointed when people say that the prevent agenda in this particular duty has actually reduced the opportunity for active debate. I think that is more about that some institutions and some teachers don't feel skilled enough to actually handle that situation. Because my feeling is it should actually promote much more active discussion as long as that is clearly you know, the push and the political will behind um, the, the, that particular legislation. And of course you can get into all sorts of debates, um, as I say, about where that extremist line is. Um, but I can only tell you again, for you know, operation officers on the street, this isn't an <coughs> academic argument. Um, we had uh, probably one of the most difficult situations in, in my career was a particular protest we had in Manchester at the time of the, um, it was the Gaza situation, um, and um, it all ended up outside one particular shop which sold Israeli, Israeli cosmetics. So all the protest was outside this shop. Um, you can imagine that for the Jewish community, they saw echoes of crystal that uh, vehemently objected to that, it, and sort of police officers stuck in the middle about, is this protest legitimate? Um, is a so-called Hamas flag um, extremist or not, offensive or not, does it break? Uh, and I profoundly felt that that was the wrong place to be having that debate. And I desperately, I spoke to the university, I spoke to the council and to churches to say, can we please take this debate somewhere else? Can we please not have this debate outside a shop in Manchester with police officers trying to make sense of the different difficult political arguments as to what is acceptable and not acceptable? And that's the sort of reality, the reality. and that's why the definition of the legislation is so important. It is not an, not an academic argument. And my fear, and what I said to the various politicians as well, do you not understand that if, well, even if you're an MP or you're a Chief Constable or you're a Police and Crime Commissioner, if this legislation comes in, you will be under enormous pressure to ban this group or to disrupt this group or whatever because they are seen as extremists. Mm -hmm. And that was part of my reality. You can imagine I came under a lot of pressure from certain communities um, to try and stop this particular protest in Manchester. I had arguments about who was damaging commerce and all the rest of it. And my line, no, sorry, we live in a democracy, this is free speech. But the difficulty is, if legislation is enacted, mm. which could have labelled some of those people as extremists, uh, and then there were abilities to take out banning orders or disruption orders or closure orders, I would have come, up, come under in immense pressure, if not possibly judicial review, as to why I was not using those powers. I have got no idea why politicians would want to be put in that position why they would want to be a position where different groups can try and label other groups as extremists. Um, uh, and as I say, just have endless legal arguments about it. I mean, I dealt with politicians who said, these are good protesters, these are bad protesters. That's, no, that is not the case. You know, you may not believe in their views, there may be certain groups you don't like, but the fact is, they've got a right to protest. Uh, and if the police negotiate with them, it doesn't mean that we agree with them. It means that if we negotiate with them and agree, we'll, we'll, they can protest in this bit and they can come in a bus so they don't wind up all the, the, you know, the, all the people passing by, then that is a good thing to, to do. Um, you know, so as I say, it all, it, it, it all exists within that, within that atmosphere. So as I say, I've I tried to um, argue, try to defend the case for prevent why I think it is very similar um, to the whole legislation that has been um, around safeguarding more generally, particularly safeguarding vulnerable people, which has been successful um, uh, in, in protecting 
vulnerable people. I've tried to highlight the dangers, though, of that take it being taken further um, into counter, uh, supposed counter extremism. Uh, the dangers of trying almost to force cohesion um, and to force the notion of rich values almost through legislation um, and police action rather than allowing it to grow naturally, um, as I think is, is actually happening. Um, and the way that, as I say, this is not an academic argument. It does very much affect the way that police officers um, uh, act on the street and the pressure they're put under. Um, it is a fascinating area. Um, I was involved in, um, when I was in Chief Council of Great Manchester in, in Operation Pathway, which as you may remember, we arrested 11 students um, uh, for quite a number of days uh, on suspicion that they were planning an attack in, in Manchester. In the end, we actually had to release them all. Um, we couldn't get enough, the CPS wouldn't charge them. Um, most got deported and eventually one got convicted in America uh, fairly recently. Um, and I suppose what really struck me about that case um, was there's almost a paradox. Um, we had good intelligence that they were planning an attack. Um, we had no idea where the attack was going to be, the time or anything. And the strange dynamic was it was actually when you had very little intelligence that because of the whole nature of terrorism, why you had to take more extreme action. So if somebody had said to me that, you know, somebody's planning to rob a bank in Manchester, there wouldn't be a lot I could have done about that, and we'd have probably, at some point, the bank would have been robbed, uh, and, you know, we'd let it happen. But it's about this whole issue of terrorism, the nature of the threat, obviously the extreme consequences meant that in a case like that, we had to take fairly extreme action, uh, despite the fact we had very little intelligence. Um, and, you know, that was probably one of the most difficult cases I, I, uh, uh, I had to de deal with. But I had to put the safety of the people of Greater Manchester first and say, um, and, and we could not take the risk and we could not allow the, uh, the, 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 the conspiracy to develop further uh, because of its consequences. Uh, and I think that just, in a way, shows, you know, the complexities of these issues um, and the degree of emotion um, which is generated around it which often, as I say, can make rational debate and rational discussion more difficult. Ken? Okay? Um,